Crossbreeding has been part of the Australian beef industry since the 1800s, but it hasn't always been used to maximum advantage. To plan a successful crossbreeding program, we must understand where the advantages in crossbreeding come from. This section considers some of the key points about a crossbreeding program and the main benefits that can be derived from crossbreeding, the breed differences, hybrid vigor, and the complementarity of using different breeds in a way which gives added advantages to the crossbreeding program. Wayne, why should people consider crossbreeding? As with any breeding program, the starting point for designing a breeding program has to be deciding which traits or characteristics are important to your system. Most likely those, the, the importance of those traits will be decided on an economic basis. Those traits could be because you want to improve your production, uh, such as, as fertility or longevity or adaptability to harsh environments, or you want to improve some market uh, criteria, uh, such as carcass yield, marbling or fattening ability. Once we start, when we start with that basis, decide which traits are important, we can then decide what components of crossbreeding we are going to use and is important to our, our crossbreeding plan uh, that will increase our production system, our productivity. What are the technical benefits of crossbreeding? There are three main benefits of crossbreeding. Firstly, you have the differences you find between breeds, where we know that some breeds excel in certain traits but are not as good for others. You might say we have specialist breeds for certain traits. But across the spectrum of all breeds, when we're designing a breeding program, we can make use of these differences between breeds as, as a real benefit to, to crossbreeding. Secondly, there is hybrid vigour. Hybrid vigour is the extra performance that occurs when you combine genes from different breeds. It is over and above the average of the two breeds that we would expect if genetic merit was purely additive. And the third effect is called complementarity. Complementarity may be defined as a benefit to the production system where we have specialist sire and dam breeds. If you have a small, highly fertile dam breed mated to a high growth, high yield sire breed, there are major efficiencies to the program, the overall breeding program. Benefits from complementarity are realised at the enterprise level, where the breed differences and hybrid vigour can be seen at the individual trait level. Kath. Can you give us a technical explanation of hybrid vigour, or heterosis as some people call it? Don, heterosis is the scientific or, or technical term for what beef producers would commonly refer to as hybrid vigour. And hybrid vigour or heterosis is the extra measurable performance we observe in the progeny of two parents above and beyond what we would have expected given the performance of the two parental breeds. If you were asked to measure hybrid vigour, how would you make that calculation? If we were interested in measuring hybrid vigour in a trait like weaning weight, we may observe in parental breed A that the average weaning weight is 220 kilograms, and we may observe in parental breed B the average weaning weight is 180 kilograms. We would then expect uh, with no heterosis that the average performance of the progeny of those two breeds would be 200 kilograms. However, we actually observe, due to the effects of heterosis, that the average progeny performance is 210 kilograms. So we have observed an extra measurable increase in performance due to heterosis. We do still observe hybrid vigour when the breeds are of similar genetic merit. In fact, it's the main effect we observe when we have breeds that are of similar performance for our particular trait of interest. In the graphic that you're now seeing on screen, you'll observe that both parental breeds 
have a weaning weight of 220 kilograms, while the crossbred progeny from those parental breeds have a weaning weight of 230 kilograms. So therefore their crossbred progeny are exhibiting hybrid vigour of 10 kilograms. A cross in um, the beef industry that would comply to this type of model could be a Hereford Angus cross. Um, both these breeds have similar growth rates, but the crossbred progeny from this cross would have high performance due to hybrid vigour. When talking about hybrid vigour or heterosis, are there different types of hybrid vigour? We do have different types of heterosis. We can observe heterosis in the individual progeny or offspring of two crosses. That's known as individual heterosis or individual hybrid vigour. We can also observe in heterosis in the maternal line. We may have an F1 or any type of cow with, made up of different breeds and there we observe maternal heterosis and this could be seen in traits such as calving rate, uh, milk and, and those sort of maternal traits and we can also observe um, heterosis in the paternal line or strain where we have a, a sire which is uh, composed of several different breeds. Is hybrid vigour the most important component of crossbreeding? Well I think there's two things we must remember when we're considering hybrid vigour and also um, designing our crossbreeding program and that's firstly that hybrid vigour doesn't always mean that crossbred, the crossbred progeny from two parental breeds will be superior to um, the best of the, the parental breeds and we saw this in fact in our first example where even the advantage of hybrid vigour in our crossbred progeny their performance was still inferior to the parental breed A in this particular example. And the other important point that we must remember um, is that hybrid vigour is not the only benefit that we observe when we're crossing different breeds. Some of the benefits that we do observe are actually from um, differences in the average performance of breeds and not just hybrid vigour. Tell us about breed differences. Why are they important? Between breed differences exist for most of traits that are of economic importance in the beef industry. So any well-designed crossbreeding program will take advantage of these between breed differences. In fact, for some traits where we don't observe a big advantage due to hybrid vigour, such as carcass traits, between breed differences are in fact more important than hybrid vigour. The United States Department of Agriculture, or USDA, has had researchers investigating between breed differences um, for decades, and the table on screen at the moment, using the number of stars, demonstrates the relative ranking of breeds for some of these more important traits in the beef industry. On the local scene, the Beef CRC has also demonstrated differences between breeds in their northern crossbreeding program. Seven breeds of bull were used over Brahmin cows and the resulting progeny all experienced the same environment in that they were run in the same paddocks or in the same feedlot up until they were slaughtered. The graph that you're seeing now on screen demonstrates the differences that were absorbed between these sire breeds for intramuscular fat. And remember that intramuscular fat are the flexor fat within the muscle, also known as marbling. Um, these steers were all um, out of Brahmin cows so the effect that we see here is purely the sire contribution to the trait and any real breed effect would be twice as big as this because obviously the cows are only contributing half of the genetics to the steer progeny. Are there any other advantages of crossbreeding? Well another advantage to crossbreeding that we haven't discussed is that crossbreeding allows us to use different breeds for the sire and the dam. We've already discussed hybrid vigour and between breed differences, but our third advantage of crossbreeding is complementarity. And that's simply where we're able to use a specialist sire or dam breed to help us achieve our breeding objective. If we think about specialist breeds for our dam line, we may be thinking about traits such as fertility and moderate cow size to enable us to reduce our feed costs for the maintenance of these cows. However, in the progeny out of these dams, we also have to ensure we have adequate levels of muscling and adequate growth rates. And these are the type of traits that we can infuse into a breeding program through the use of specialist sire breeds. However, we must remember that complementarity only works in a terminal program because as soon as you retain females out of these specialist sire breeds, you infuse those into the female makeup of your herd and you lose the effect of your specialist stand breed. Can you give us an example of a program that shows complementarity? 
Well, the picture that you're seeing on screen now is a classic example of complementarity in the beef industry, where we have an Angus Cross Jersey dam exhibiting fertility and also a low maintenance animal. And we're crossing that with a Charolais sire, where the Charolais sire infuses growth and muscling into our crossbred progeny and allows us to better meet our breeding objective. What level of hybrid vigour can we expect from different crossbreeding systems? Some of the more common systems that are crossbreeding systems that are in place in the Australian beef industry include a two-way cross where we have uh, a sire and a dam of different breed and there we would expect 100% individual heterosis in the resulting offspring. We also have some systems where we have an F1 cow crossed to a terminal sire. We would expect then, if assuming that the breed in the terminal sire is not represented in the F1 cow, that we would observe 100% individual heterosis in the resulting offspring. And in that cross, we also observe maternal heterosis, given that we have an F1 cow with different, two different breeds represented. What percentage increase in performance can we expect from a two-way or three-way rotational cross? In a two-way cross, we can expect somewhere in the ballpark of 5 to 10% increase in growth traits, such as weights, uh, those type of production traits. When we move on to the terminal sire over an F1 cow, we can see a greater boost, um, around 20 to 40% sometimes in increase in production traits in the resulting offspring. Would the 40% value be when you're including Brahmins in the cross? Certainly if we're crossing, um, putting a Bos indicus type animal in there with a Bos taurus, we're going to see an extra boost because of the differences in those two gene pools. Where you refer to 40% hybrid vigour, would it come from Brahmin crossbreds? The, the higher figure will tend to be when we're infusing a Bos indicus into that cross. Okay. We have heard about rotational systems. Do we retain 100% hybrid vigour in rotational systems? No, we don't retain 100% heterosis or hybrid vigour in rotational systems, Don. And actually the percent of heterosis that we do observe in those systems depends on the number of breeds that we have represented. For example, if we have a two-breed rotational cross, we will observe in the long term 67% of um, heterosis in the progeny. Whereas if we have greater number of breeds, such as we move to three breeds rotational system, we'll observe 75% of heterosis retained in the offspring. Do you lose all your hybrid vigour in a composite breeding situation? No, heterosis is also retained in composites, Don. And again, um, heterosis, the amount of heterosis retained for composites is proportional uh, or dependent on the number of breeds making up the composite and the proportion of those breeds making up the composite. Um, there's a simple formula for calculating the amount of heterosis retained, however I won't bore you with the details. A few examples, if we have a composite made up of two breeds where we have a 50-50 mix, we will observe 50% retain heterosis in the progeny. If we move that up to three breeds in the composite, we'll retain 67% of heterosis in the progeny, whereas if we move that to four breeds in the composite, we will retain 75% of the heterosis in the progeny for that composite. Is inbreeding important in crossbreeding? No, Don, that's assuming that there's no inbreeding occurring in that composite population because the effects of inbreeding on the population are the opposite to the effects of hybrid vigour or heterosis. Are all traits affected the same way by hybrid vigour? No, Don, there are some traits that receive extra benefits or we observe extra performance due to heterosis. Uh, these tend to be survival or fitness traits. In beef cattle, this is usually observed in fertility or longevity type traits uh, where we receive the most increase in measurable performance. Uh, then if we move on to growth traits, we observe a moderate amount of um, extra performance and on the lower end of the scale are the carcass type traits where we don't observe um, as much increased performance in the progeny. It tends to be traits such as survival or fitness traits that have low heritabilities, they receive the most boost from heterosis, whereas traits such as carcass traits where we observe high heritabilities that are under a high degree of genetic control, where we observe the least amount of increased measurable performance due to heterosis. So does that mean if we wanted to improve the carcass traits, we couldn't depend 
on hybrid vigour and we need to look more carefully at the breeds we select. We may want to select breeds that complement each other, for example the terminal crossover in F1 cow, we may be ch carefully choosing a breed that will have the carcass attributes that we need for the progeny.